What are the Door Roller community's favorite personal finance books? What's the one type of book that nobody mentioned but that everybody should read? And would you listen to a biography that spanned 35 CDs? One listener did. We'll answer these questions and more on the 126th episode of the Dough Roller Podcast. Welcome to the Dough Roller Podcast, where the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. We help you make more, spend less, and invest the rest. And now your host, Rob Berger. Whether you're just starting out buried under a mountain of debt or well on your way to financial freedom, this is the podcast to help you take your finances to the next level. Hey, everybody. Hope you're having a great day. Uh, On today's show, uh, we are going to be covering uh, the question of the week. So if you get the newsletter that I send out every Saturday, you know that I've added a question of the week and have been getting some great responses from everybody. The idea was simple was to take all of your collective wisdom, bring it together on a single question each week, and then share it with you. And hopefully uh, you can learn. I know I have. Today's uh, question deals with uh, what's your favorite personal finance or investing book? And while a lot of the answers are books that I'm very familiar with and have read, there were some new ones for me. And uh, I always like to, to, to um, hear about new books, um, new websites, new new anything as it relates to money and finance, tools, calculators, everything. And um, I'm an avid reader, and so I will no doubt read a number of the books that other folks have uh, have uh, identified as their favorite. So what I'm going to do today is kind of go down uh, and, and, and walk through the books that folks uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, there's uh, a lot of, uh, of course, as you might expect, there were a few books that were mentioned many times, and uh, we'll cover those as well as uh, some books that were only mentioned once uh, that are perhaps le- less familiar. And I, I, I suspect there'll be some books that you've never heard of, even if you were an avid reader of personal finance and investing books. And then I'm going to mention um, one or two of, of my favorites that uh, hopefully are new to you. Uh, in fact, they're not really, strictly speaking, personal finance books. Uh, but I think they can be very helpful as you try to make the most of your money. So that's the that's the plan for today's show. Before I get to that though, I do want to read an email that I received. You may remember from podcast number 120, I attempted to answer a question for a listener named Christy and the the question was, should they hold off uh, for a couple of years saving for retirement so that they can um, build up uh, uh, some money for a down payment on a home? Or should they not do that and go ahead and keep saving for retirement and, and save whatever else they can after that for a home and maybe take them, probably take them longer to buy a home, uh, but they wouldn't um, slow down the retirement savings? What, what should they do? Well, I tried to answer that, not in a, a way that would, you know, there's no one right answer to that, but I kind of tried to walk through, you know, some factors that you might want to think about, how you might want to approach uh, that kind of, of question. And uh, that was in podcast 120, doughroller.net slash podcast 120. Well, Christy wrote back in, sent me another email, and she'd listened to the show, uh, but what she emailed me with was what they decided to do. And uh, here's what she had to say. She said, hi, Rob, thanks for making my question a podcast episode and for saving me from doing the math myself. I thought you might be interested to know what my husband and I decided to do. After talking about the different options, we decided to go ahead and make retirement contributions for a variety of reasons. First, when I attended orientation for my new job, I found out that even as a per diem employee, I'm eligible for a 401k with uh, an employer match. That's good. We can't really pass that up. No, you can't. Above that, though, we started talking about compounding and realized that we can always save for a house, but we can never go back and make up for a year of missed retirement savings. We also had the realization that because we expect our income to go up significantly, if we keep our spending where it is now, then two years from now, we could probably save 20% over the course of one year or less. So our goal is to get to where we are maxing out uh, my 401k and two IRAs, and only then save for the down payment. Who knows what the next few years will bring, but this is our plan. Maybe if you are still doing the show, I will check back in when we finally do end up buying a house. Well, Christy, that would be fantastic. I still, I sure hope I'm still doing the show, but you never know. Uh, and uh, would love to hear from you again when you do finally make that decision. It sounds like you've made 
uh, a good decision for you guys that works for you. It certainly is hard to pass up an employer match. I generally think it's almost never uh, a good idea, although I hate to say never, but usually it's not a good idea to pass up that employer match. So it sounds like you guys have a great plan uh, and uh, best of luck to both of you. Okay, so now we're going to walk through uh, the books that folks uh, responded to the the question of the week in the newsletter. The books that you all identified, some of your favorites, again, I think uh, some of these will be be well known to most everybody. I think some of them will, might, might be new to you. So we're going to begin with the most popular book. What do you think it, it what, what do you think it is? And I'll give you a hint. It was not written by Dave Ramsey. He was number two, by the way. Number one book, Millionaire Next Door. Uh, it's a book that I read many, many years ago uh, and uh, enjoyed it uh, very much. And um, it's, a, it's basically about, through a lot of interviews, what the typical millionaire is like. And the idea of the book was to, and it was written by uh, a, a PhD, his name is Thomas Stanley. I think the idea of the book was to, to, um, to suggest that maybe a lot of folks' views of what a millionaire is like are not reality, that most millionaires aren't what we think uh, they are. They don't live the way we think they live. And, you know, there are certainly those that are very wealthy and they they show it, right? And they live in big homes and drive very expensive cars and spend a lot of money. Uh, But what the millionaire next door tells us is, you know, yeah, those kind of folks may get the most attention, but they're not the typical millionaire. Typical millionaire you know, drives a pretty basic car, not an expensive one, typically, uh, one that they keep for a long time. Um, and um, they don't spend money like you'd expect. They're not spending a fortune on clothes or a fortune on jewelry. Uh, they tend to uh, stay married, by the way. Uh, they tend to, to live in the same home for a very long time. They're not constantly upgrading. And um, uh, are in some ways frugal, at least by the standards that they've been able to, to, to develop for themselves, given uh, the money that they have. Many of them are business owners, but of course not all of them are. Uh, many of them are professionals. Many of them are are, are just you know <laughs> everyday uh, workers that have, have saved their money well. Uh, it's not sort of the flashy thing that you might think of when you think of uh, a millionaire. And the thing that I found interesting, you know, th- there was one discussion in the book. Again, it's been some time since I, I read it, but one thing that, that that I remember is that a lot of they, they would do these interviews and they'd invite these folks in for an interview and they give them a free lunch. And apparently a lot of them would come in because they wanted the free lunch. And I thought that was interesting to me. See, I, I, that's not me at all. You know, if someone, if an author called me up, Millionaire Next Door author called me up and they wanted to interview me, the fact that they were going to feed me would not at all entice me uh, to go in and spend my, my time and my day in an interview. Wouldn't, not at all. Now, but for some of these folks, it did. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, because you know, there's obviously going to be a range of personalities and a range of of, of behavior. I suspect I kind of fall somewhere in the middle. I'm I, I'm certainly not to the point where I'm going to go, you know, sit through a discussion for an hour because someone's going to feed me. At the same time, I think for the most part we live a pretty. Um, I was going to say boring life. I'm not sure if that's right, but I mean it's, you know, I, I don't spend a lot of money on clothes. I don't spend a lot of money, you know, uh, on whatever expensive watches and you know things like that. I, you know, we 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 you know the last car I bought was a used Camry, um, and you know the one thing that in talking to folks because I know a lot of folks that don't do that. I know a lot of folks that get a new car every two years, go on some really interesting vacations, and money is a struggle for them every single day of the week. They they barely get by. And, you know, one might look at this and say, well, you know, Rob, some of these folks in the book and others and, you know, they're sacrificing. Yeah, you know, I don't want to do that. You only live once, right? We like to say that as if that's somehow some sort of meaningful statement that should dictate the choices that we make in life. But, you know, you hear it a lot. You only live once. Uh, You don't take it with you. No, you sure don't. Um, (laughs) But here's the thing that, that I've come to believe is that I think my hunch is that the folks that this book writes about, these millionaires... They don't view it as sacrifice at all. They don't need a brand new car every two years to be happy. They're very, very content driving the car that they drive, wearing the clothes that they wear, and doing the things that they do. They don't need to spend money to be happy. So, you know, when you talk about, you know, when you hear folks that, that maybe are living month to month and spending a lot of money on things and they think, well, I don't want to sacrifice, uh, part of the trick is figuring out how to be content um, and without seeing it as sacrifice. 
And uh, that's what I think a lot of the folks that this book talks about. I think that's what they've done. They, they, they just don't need to spend money. It's all relative, of course. You know, some people have more and they spend more, but they don't need to spend money in a lot of ways that a lot of people do to be happy, to be content. And I can tell you in my own life, you know, I was thinking about, you know, things that, that my wife and I might do with a little extra money that we might have from month to month. And I had a hard time coming up with something. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I, like I said, I don't want to go out and spend a lot of money on clothes. Um, you know, even expensive vacations, you know, are not my thing, really. I mean, we like to travel. We travel some. Uh, over the years, we've gone to so many fun places. But, you know, our, our, we're thinking our next vacation is a national park here in the United States, you know. So um, uh, it's not like a 10-day a trip to Europe or something, although we have been to Europe. But we just don't you know, we just don't spend that money and it's not, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice to me at all. And I suspect a lot of folks in that book would say the same thing. In any event, it is an excellent book. I was happy to see it as the number one book uh, identified by subscribers to the newsletter. And uh, if you haven't read it, I think it's a very good book to read. By the way, I'll have links to all of these books on Amazon. Um, in the show notes to this episode, which you'll find again at doorroller.net slash podcast 126. So that was the number one book, Millionaire Next Door. Uh, a listener, or I guess a reader named Bill had commented, and um, he said, I'm not going to tell you what this means. You've got to read the book to figure it out. He says, a wonderful insight on how the minds work of people that are from both camps, UAWs and PAWs. Although I never would have considered myself as a PAW, I am. So UAW and PAW, you got to read the book to figure out what that, what that means. But that's what Bill had to say about The Millionaire Next Door. Uh, the number two book was Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. And it's a book that I've, I've actually skimmed. I haven't read it page for page. Obviously, it's a book that's helped a lot of people get out of debt. And Jason uh, wrote in and said, very good for when inspiration is needed to continue paying down your debt. And personally... I, th- I think that's what Dave Ramsey is best at, is inspiring people. And I can tell you he inspired me. I've never really been sort of a, a Dave Ramsey follower, per se. I never went through his baby steps or whatever he calls them. That's not how I approached it. But I still have a, a vivid memory of being 40. So this was eight years ago in my workshop, listening to Dave Ra- Ramsey's radio uh, program and hearing all these crazy people screaming that they're debt-free. And I thought, you know, that's where I want to be. And at that time, we had school loans, credit card debt. Uh, uh, home equity line of credit. Today, eight years later, that's all gone. We don't have any of that. We have a mortgage and that's it. And I can remember writing on a piece of paper that unfortunately I can no longer find, but I was 40, I remember it. And my, I wrote on this paper, I will be debt-free by the time I'm 50. And, and that included the mortgage. So I got two, two plus years to go on the mortgage. Uh, we'll see if I actually decide to pay it off. But at the time, that was probably a silly goal, it was, an unrealistic goal. But I decided, you know, well, a lot can happen in ten years. I'm gonna. Uh, uh, that's my goal. And uh, you know, I didn't. I don't listen to the Dave Ramsey show regularly at all. Um, in fact, now I probably only listen to it when a reader uh, emails me or a listener emails me and says, "You got to listen to this episode." He said such and such and such about investing. That's usually when I listen to the Dave Ramsey show. But he was a big inspiration for me, and he was. A, it appears to be a, a big inspiration for Jason uh, as well. And uh, so, you know, if you're struggling with with debt and credit card debt and all that sort of thing, you know, it's a great book to read. Uh, it really is. And uh, he can be very inspiring. And I think his program for getting out of debt is, is a good one. And it's helped a lot of, a lot, a lot of, a lot of people. And uh, a listener named Jeff wrote in, he actually listed several books. In fact, he said, I can't answer with one book because different books have helped me at different times in my life. And that's so true. For what it's worth, here are my thoughts. And on the Total Money Makeover, he said, this helped me like it has countless, uh, countless others get out of debt. Uh, um, uh, just as a reminder, I listen to it on CD every year. So that's what he, what Jeff had to say about the Total Money Makeover by Dave Ramsey. By the way, on The Millionaire Next Door, he said, I don't think I have heard you talk about this before. I, by, by the way, he later e- emailed back in after he listened to the interview where a listener interviewed me in the last uh, episode where I did mention it. So he emailed me back back on that. But he said, I don't think I've heard you talk about this before. But before Mr. Money Mustache, this is the book that taught frugality and being smart with your money. The follow-up, The Millionaire Mind, which I've not read, is also good. I have read or listened to on CD both 
uh, of these uh, several times. So that was his comment on The Millionaire Next Door. Let me jump back to it. But on the Total Money Makeover, it's interesting that he listens to it uh, every, every year, just as a reminder. Again, it's, it's an, it, it is very good uh, for um, uh, inspiration, you know, which you need. You know, when you're struggling with debt, man, and you make some progress and then something happens, the car breaks down, whatever, and you go back into more debt, it can be very discouraging. And, you know, you need that, that inspiration, that shot in the arm. And I think Dave Ramsey is very good at that. So now, what, what are after those two? Those, were two the, those two were by far the most popular out of all of them. Several of these others had many folks mention them, but those were by far the, the two biggest responses uh, to the question of the week. So let's get sort of the next layer. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So Rich Dad, Poor Dad was actually uh, one of uh, the, first, the first books that I read, I think. One of the first personal finance books that I can remember uh, reading by uh, Robert Ki- Kiyosaki. I always have trouble with his name. So it's funny. I'm not a fan of him. Uh, because after Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he started writing a lot of stuff that I think is complete junk. And I can remember he had a column on on Yahoo Finance that I thought was just awful. And um, I won't get into all that, but Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the reason I like it and the reason I think it's a good book is because he he talks about how looking at your assets, those that, by assets I mean um, not just any asset, but assets that can help you build wealth. Uh, like you know, investments, whether it's in real estate, which is his sort of, uh, I guess, expertise, or mutual funds, ETFs, a business, whatever, assets that can help you uh, build wealth uh, versus expenses and debts that will over time help you lose wealth and make it harder for you to build wealth. And he, and he really does a good job, I think, of graphically displaying this in his book, by showing someone who's spending more than they make and how that cycle works and you just it's hard to get out of that cycle when you're in it versus someone who's living below their means taking that extra cash each month and putting it into investments that will grow in value uh, over time that concept which is so important to understand i think he did certainly as good a job as i've seen in any book to describe it how it works, why it works, how important it is. And, and, and that's why I liked that book so much, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, it was a very good book. And uh, again, it was one that was mentioned by a number of readers uh, in, uh, in, the, in the question of, of, of the week. So that, that was a good one. There were then a couple of folks that mentioned uh, books by David Bach, which, you know, he's a very well-known um, uh, personal finance author. He's probably, I, I guess, his best known book is The Automatic Millionaire. And that was one, actually, that was one that Jeff mentioned. Uh, the, you know, he mentioned The Total Money Makeover, Millionaire Next Door, and then The Automatic Millionaire. Um, and then an, an, another uh, listener mentioned Smart Women Finish Rich, which is another David Bach book. I confess, I have never read a book by David Bach. I don't think I ever will. Just no, no reason to, I don't think. Uh, but they're very popular, and uh, they seem to be well regarded. And as I mentioned, these two were were books that were mentioned by folks. Jeff had this to say about the automatic millionaire. He said, "I haven't heard you mention this one either." And he's right about that. I've never read it. The first third of the book, where he profiles the wealthy couple who never made much money but made saving and investing automatic early in their lives and became super rich, is wonderfully helpful and motivating. Even now, when I implement a strategy towards uh, wealth building. I can hear the little voice in my head saying, make it automatic. So I thought that was a great comment uh, and I think a good endorsement for that book. Again, I can't uh, uh, give you my thoughts on it. I've not read it, but that's from Jeff. And the thing about making things automatic, that is uh, such an important part of just, it does a couple of things. First of all, when you automate something, uh, even when it's saving, you eventually just completely forget about it. You really do. You just, you know, your money comes out of your check into your 401k, for example. And it may be painful when you first set it up or when you increase the contribution amount, but give it a couple of paychecks, a couple of months, you'll, you'll eventually just completely uh, forget about it and it'll just start to build wealth for you without you even thinking about it. And uh, it really won't hurt as much as you think. And then, of course, the, the automation part of it too just makes life easier. You know, I automate as much of my finances as I can, not only investing, but also paying bills. So most of our uh, monthly bills are paid automatically. I don't have to write a check or, or, or log into my bank account and, and, and uh, initiate the payment. It happens automatically. 
and that just makes um, life easier. So uh, anyway, uh, those were the two books by David Bach that were, were mentioned, The Automatic Millionaire and Smart Women Finish Rich. Um, another book that was mentioned several times, you ready for this one? The Bible. Now, the Bible is a book I've read. Uh, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. Went to a Christian high school. I don't think I've ever mentioned that. I, mean, I went to a Christian high school. Started a, Actually, I started at a Christian school in the eighth grade. Uh, wasn't a, it was a, it was a good school. It wasn't a, it certainly wasn't an exclusive type of, you know, school. Um, and in fact, the high school is now closed. Uh, I understand in, in, in Ohio, but in any event, I went to a Christian high school and I went to a Christian liberal, liberal arts college. Uh, and so not only have I read the Bible from cover to cover, I've taken more Bible classes than I can remember. Um, and, uh, so study the Bible extensively. It's interesting though, uh, have never studied the Bible specifically as it relates to to uh, advice or, or wisdom, I guess I should say, about money. And I probably ought to do a podcast because here's the deal. Regardless of your own personal views about the Bible and what it is, uh, the, the wisdom in, in the Bible uh, on a lot of topics, but certainly with respect to money, are, are, are quite good and sound. And, and again, that's regardless of your faith, your view of the Bible doesn't really matter. Uh, so, you know, I probably ought to do a show on that because if I if I went through a lot of my notes and things, I could pull together, uh, I think, uh, a lot of good uh, wisdom on handling money, uh, uh, debt, uh, investing. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff uh, uh, from the Bible. And in any event, it was a, it was a book that uh, a number of folks mentioned in their reply. And so there you go. Uh, What's next? Okay, here's one that I've not I've not read. Only one person mentioned this one: Sound Mind Investing Handbook. So that one was new to me, um, and so I can't comment on it in terms of you know uh, if it's a good book or not. But one one listener really liked it, and uh, and so I wanted to to mention that. And the reader who mentioned it, his name is John, uh, actually gave me a website to go to for this. I guess it's a handbook. He also mentioned, he was one of the individuals that mentioned the Bible as well. And so let me, let me read you his whole comment. I think you'll find it interesting. He, said, he, he wrote and he said this, I found podcast 124 as you covered the quote questions of the week to be very entertaining and informative. In response to this week's question of what is my favorite book about money, my first response is the Bible and the biblical financial principles as taught uh, by the late Larry uh, Burkett and Howard uh, Dayton and also Dave Ramsey. Uh, the teaching on biblical financial principles from these men has changed my life. My second response uh, is the sound, and this is where we get to the Sound Mind Investing Handbook, and he gives me a link. I'll include it in the show notes. Uh, the book was a wonderful primer to me, going from budgeting to investing and presenting a simple, straightforward plan for investing. It was also really engaging with highlights of key text and summaries uh, of each of each chapter. So there you go. Again, I will leave a link to that handbook in the show notes. It's kind of a rather long URL, but I will leave a link to that uh, in the show notes. I'm going to check it out myself, and John, appreciate you bringing that uh, to, to our attention. Okay, so what else do we have? So uh, a reader named Lisa mentioned Debt Proof Living. That's a great title. And uh, she, she wrote, favorite money book? Well, Debt Proof Living is my quote-unquote Bible, as is anything Mary Hunt writes currently reading Financially Fearless because I'm using LearnVest's uh, coaching. So there you go. That's a big endorsement for Debt Proof Living, and I, I, lo- I love the title. And uh, trust me when I say it's, it's a great way to live. And uh, so, Lisa, I appreciate uh, you mentioning uh, that book. Uh, several others. Uh, one person, I'm surprised only one person mentioned this next book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Now, I've had folks on the show, guests on the show, um, who who have mentioned this book before? I've read it, uh, and uh, it, you know it's a very good book um, on investing by Burton uh, Malkiel, and I always have a trouble with his name too. Um, uh, but he's written a number of of, of good books. Um, more recently, the Elements of Investing was another one that he wrote. But a random walk down Wall Street is you know if you're if you're if you're learning to invest and you want to go beyond. Um, what I would call just the very basic things that you need to know about investing. 
Some people don't want to. Some people want to say, you know, uh, sign me up for Betterment. My money's in there, and I'm good to go. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs> that's fine. That's that's fine. Uh, but if you say, yeah, I'd kind of like to know a little bit more about that, there are a number of books that I would recommend. One of them is A Random Walk Down Wall Street. It's easy to read. It's a good book. Uh, liked it uh, a, a lot. So that's that, that's that's one. By the way, if there were others, I would include – these weren't mentioned by folks in response to the question of the week, but – um, uh, all about asset allocation. Rick Ferry is another good one. The Four Pillars of Investing is, uh, I think, um, a, a, a great uh, a great book um, th- that I would absolutely put um, in, in in the top. That's by William Bernstein. The other one is, and I'll mention one more. And there are a lot of good ones, but I'll mention one more before we move on, and that is. Um, the Bogleheads, right? They have the Bogleheads Guide to Investing. I've mentioned it before, but the Bogleheads is named after Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, and it's basically a group of guys that 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 um, believe in sort of the Vanguard indexed, low cost way to invest. And they wrote a book some years ago. It's been updated, but um, they have the actually they have a couple that are good. One is the Bogleheads Guide to Investing. They also have. The Boglehead's Guide to Retirement Planning, and they're really they're both really good books, and uh, I couldn't I can't recommend them enough. But on the investing front, the Boglehead's Guide to Investing, so those would all be sort of books that I would put in that category for folks who want to learn uh, a little bit a bit more than just you know, hey four hundred one k here's my money thanks and good luck <laughs> hope things go well for me over the next four decades. Um, and uh, so those are good ones. Again, the random walk down Wall Street. Uh, is another one. Um, another book that someone mentioned, one that we've talked about on this show before, is Money Ratios. So this was by Charles Farrell. It's a very good book. Um, uh, I've talked about it, uh, particularly as it relates to how much should you, how much should you have in the bank? Say you're, uh, say you're 35 and you make 80,000 bucks a year. How much should you have in retirement for, save for retirement, if you to, to consider yourself as being on track, assuming you want to retire to traditional age of say 65. How much should you have? Or you're, you're 47 and you make $125,000 a year and you've got whatever, $400,000 in retirement. Are you on track? Well, the money ratios, this concept that was created by Charles Farrell, who by the way is a lawyer, don't hold that against him, uh, is uh, I think a good approach. It's not the only approach um, and I wouldn't stop with this analysis, but they, he gives you some very easy to apply ratios uh, that will tell you if you're on track. And the ratios can tell you, for example, well, by such and such an age, you should have X times your current income to be on track um, is, is one example. And you should be saving X percent of your income. Now, you know there are other ways to approach r- retirement planning for sure. Uh, but this is one of them and it's easy to apply and uh, definitely um, a good book. And I, I found it to be a very a fun book uh, uh, to read. So um, that's the money ratios. We're getting down towards the end here. I had one. This was not one I hadn't heard of. Find a penny, a financial journey. If you've if you've read that, I'd love to shoot me an email. Let me know um, what what you thought of it. That's not a book that that I have have um, I have read, but I kind of like the title. Find a penny, a financial journey. So uh, a listener, a reader, wrote in uh, with that. Another one by Ben Stein. Uh, and Phil DeMuth, who, who knows who Bill, Ben Stein is? Sure you do, right? Ferris Bueller's Day Off anyway. The Little Book of Bulletproof Investing. That's another one uh, that, I have not, that I have not read, um, but, but a reader wrote in. So that's one I'm definitely going to uh, check out. Uh, the Little Book of Bulletproof Investing. Do's and don'ts to protect your financial uh, life. And um, so I'll be, I'll be reading that. And uh, I like Ben Stein. Obviously a smart guy. And uh, I think a good writer. So that that's one that I plan to to read. I'm going to put it on my uh, my list. And um, another one, uh, a reader named Judy wrote in, "Money for Life" by Steve Vernon. Uh, she said this book was helpful in framing how to approach your resources five years before retirement, five years pre-retirement to actual retirement years. And it was an it was an understandable English, which is just a bonus right there. So that's what Judy had to say about Money for Life by Steve uh, Vernon. So uh, uh, another book that I had not um, heard of, but I'm going to check out. Although I'm not quite there to the five years pre-retirement yet. I got a few more years ahead of me. Uh, knock on wood. So those were the those were the books. A lot of great um, and interesting um, favorites that you all sent in, and I appreciate that. 
One that I'm going to mention, uh, uh, it's really sort of a type of book uh, that I'm going to mention, although I'm going to give you a specific example that, that folks really didn't talk about in their responses. And it's, it's this. I think that habits, our habits, our routines, have such a huge impact on our finances, a huge impact on our finances in ways that are very easy to kind of lose focus on. You know, we just kind of live our life and we have routines and routines are good. Routines aren't a bad thing. Um, but, you know, our routines can really dictate what our finances look like uh, as we move th- through life. And, um, and so I've really, it's not, and it's not just about personal finance. It's not just about how much money you have in, in the bank. You know, it's, it's about whether you ever write that, that novel that's inside of you that you've wanted to write for years and you just haven't done it. It's about, you know, wishing that your, your basement or your garage were cleaned out, but it just always seems to be a complete mess. And we have folks in the neighborhood who never park their cars in the garage, which I don't understand, by the way. But in any event, you know, it's about how productive you are at work and how much fulfillment you get from the, the work that you do every day. Habits are, are huge. And I've been doing a lot of reading. In fact, I'm going to talk about this in future uh, podcasts, but I've been doing a lot of reading about the concepts like habit stacking, mini habits, um, checklists, the power of a checklist, uh, which is a very interesting uh, concept. I'm reading a book now by a doctor uh, who talks about it in the in the in, in part in the context of checklists that uh, surgeons will go through and how important they are. They have checklists in the field of aviation, uh, as you might imagine. Uh, but you know, checklists can be a very powerful tool for you and I as well. So I've been reading about all of these things and really trying to think about uh, how I spend my day. And, and it's not just a matter of trying to squeeze out every ounce of possible productivity from a day. You know, I think being productive is important, but I don't think it's the only thing. But you know, we you know, we are what we do every day. I mean, you know, each day by itself may not seem that important, but you know, a day is is a week, it's a month, it's a year, it's a decade, it's a lifetime, and uh, we can only get through this world one day at a time. And I think how we spend that day is so important. So I've been personally really focused on that and reading a lot of books. The book that I want to mention today is one. Uh, that actually I, I read some time ago, although it's a fairly new book. I'm looking at the date now. Let's see. February of 2012, it came out uh, by Charles Duhigg, and it's The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business. Uh, it's a book that I can't recommend enough. I really enjoyed it. It's not per se a personal finance book or an investing book. It's, 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 sort of, it's more fundamental than that. And the thing that that I think I enjoyed the most about the book was simply that it it it, it was this it was the book that started me down the path of of really focusing on my habits and my routines and asking myself what you know how do I spend my day how should I spend my day uh, as well as how I spend my money and how do the habits that I have good or bad affect my bank account my investing. Uh, and and that, that was really the book that started it for me. I've since read m- many more, and as I said, I'm going to do some podcasts on it. You know, for example, I've started a, a process of how I deal with my email. I get a ton of email, and I've, I'm, v- I'm very happy to stay on top of it. In fact, when I go into uh, my email for Door Roller right now, I have 12 email. That's it. And, uh, you know, there's the thing called in- in- Inbox Zero. I almost never get quite to zero. But if I have any more than a few, then um, I deal with it. And there's a whole process that I have. I'll share that uh, in a future podcast. I have a process now for how I stay productive during the day. And it involves certain habits. It involves um, checklists uh, and other things that I've developed that work for me. And I'm going to share that with you in a future a future um, podcast. But the, the, the bigger point isn't how I do it. How I do it may or may not work for you. Uh, the real point is being focused on it and figuring out what works for you. So it's it's really a combination of things, but at its core are habits and routines. And um, and so that's something that I think uh, is important, and I wanted to share it with you. The Power of Habit, uh, not the only book out there on this topic for sure, uh, but one that I found to be uh, very good. In fact, as I look at it now, I'm, I have it on my iPad. I'm going to go back and, and reread it. Um, you know, it's funny. I'm on Amazon now looking at it. It actually tells me when I bought it. I bought it September 6, 2013. Well, there you go. That's when I read it shortly after that. So yeah, that's about right. It was about a year ago. That kind of got me thinking on this path. 
And uh, so anyway, I wanted to mention that. I think it's, um, it's a good book and uh, you, you might want to check it out. And in that regard, I should mention one other thing. I'd, I'd mentioned a listener named Jeff who, who wrote in with several books that he, um, that he liked. He had a, what he called a bonus thought in his email. He said, as a bonus thought, I just listened to a Success Magazine CD where Darren Hardy interviewed Tom Corley, the author of Rich Habits. Incredible interview. This will be the next book I read on finances. I wanted to mention that. I've not read Rich Habits. Uh, I will definitely check it out. I'm not familiar with Tom Corley, uh, but I wanted to pass that on to you. So that that was the closest we got to someone mentioning a book about habits, Rich Habits by Tom Corley. Again, I haven't read it. But here's the other thing that Jeff uh, mentioned, and I want to. this is sort of a closing thought. And this is, again, a, 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 another type of book about finances, but very, very different than anything we've mentioned so far on the show. Here's what Jeff had to say. I love biography, and I love personal finance, so it is no surprise that m- maybe my favorite book of all time is Titan, the biography of John D. Rockefeller Sr. by Ron Chernow. I was mesmerized and absolutely loved all 35 CDs in the unabridged audiobook. Rockefeller and his family were are fascinating, and his business sense and the way he handled money were most interesting. The audio production of this book actually captivated me to the point that I would find myself driving around just to continue listening. Wow. Well, there you go. I am definitely going to check that out, although I'm not sure I'll, re- I'll listen to 35 CDs. I'm more likely to read it, uh, but I wanted to pass that on as yet another book that's, I guess, about money in a different perspective, of course, a biography. Uh, But I wanted to pass that on to you. If you're a fan of biography and history, I suspect you'll like that book very much. Well, there you go. Those were the answers, the replies that folks sent in. Hopefully in the list, you found some books that maybe you're not familiar with, books that maybe uh, you'll check out, and hopefully they can help you improve your finances, improve your investing, improve, improve your life. And if I've missed anything, if you have books, maybe you didn't have time to reply to the newsletter, that's fine. Uh, but if you have others, I'd love to hear from you. Happy to mention them on a future podcast. Just shoot me an email at dr.doroller.net. Uh, and if you're not getting the newsletter, shame on you. You can uh, sign up. It's free and worth every penny. You can just go to doroller.net slash newsletter. Sign up takes about six and a half seconds. And uh, the newsletter goes out every Saturday at 7 p.m., hopefully. And uh, people seem to like it. We got over 18,000 subscribers, and that's growing. And... Uh, uh, hopefully it's uh, helping you if you do get it. And if you don't, you can sign up. Would love to have you be part of the community. Hey, until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. <laughs>